This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by my book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating, which is now available wherever books are sold. Just go to christyharrison.com slash book to get it. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author of the book, Anti-Diet. Join me here every week as I talk with fellow anti-diet advocates about their journeys toward peace with food and their bodies. And by the way, on this show, we bleep out diet culture stuff like weight and calorie numbers, but we don't censor swear words or other adult language, so listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to episode 236 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with sociology professor and author Abigail Segui about the effects of weight stigma, racism, poverty, and other forms of oppression on health, why you can't quote-unquote fight weight stigma while promoting weight management, how supposedly sociocultural interventions often just end up targeting individuals, coming out as an act of social change, and so much more. It's a really great conversation, and I can't wait to share it with you in just a moment. This is another one, by the way, that I have fast-tracked to be relevant for COVID-19. So this is coming out way before some of the other episodes that I recorded previously. But of course, I'm still going to release all the previously recorded ones as well. But before I share this conversation with you, my conversation with Abigail, I'll answer this week's listener question, which is from a listener named Mata, who writes, I'm seeing a lot of messages that quote-unquote obesity is a risk factor for contracting and dying from coronavirus. Even on the CDC website, I'm seeing that. I'm in the highest BMI category and in recovery for a lifelong eating disorder. It's been really difficult to dispel all the fatphobic messages associated with COVID-19, especially since the CDC has listed my BMI category as a risk factor. I'm not even sure what my question is, but I think I need some reassurance, since I have no plan to ever diet again. How do I continue to tell everyone that weight has nothing to do with health when the CDC is saying otherwise? So thanks, Mata, for that great question. And before I answer, just my standard disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. So I posted about this very issue on social media a few weeks ago. And actually, as I'm recording this, I'm also working on turning that piece into an op-ed for publication. And so I'll link to that op-ed here whenever it's ready. Hopefully it'll be out by the time you hear this episode, but if not, we'll put it in the show notes later. But it's really fascinating to research this because so far from what I've found in my hours and hours and hours of research and scouring for evidence to back up this claim, I haven't found anything really solid or convincing to say that weight itself is a risk factor and especially not a risk factor for death from COVID-19 or a risk factor for contracting it, for that matter. And so I'll share just a little bit of what I'm finding in my research on this topic. And maybe by the time this episode's out, like I said, I can sh- I can share the op-ed in the show notes, but this is ever-changing. So just a caveat there, I'm also recording this uh, about two weeks ahead. I record all of these intros about two weeks before the episode drops. So check back on the website, on the show notes, for the latest updates and for my most recent writing on the topic. But the first thing I'll say is that it's really unclear to me where the CDC is getting the evidence for that information. I actually reached out to their media relations team a few days ago to ask if they could share the data that they're using as evidence of risk, higher risk for higher BMI folks. And so far, no one has gotten back to me. They haven't responded with any evidence that they're using to base that on. 
From what I can gather, though, from the evidence that is out there, it seems like the CDC initially extrapolated that data from another viral pandemic, which was H1N1 or swine flu, which happened in 2009 and 2010. And some scientific studies about that pandemic 10 years ago found that having a BMI in the O categories did increase people's risk of severe outcomes from the virus. However, a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that had been published about weight and swine flu five years later, so like the studies were coming out from 2009 to 2011 or whatever, or to, you know 2015, and then in 2016, researchers did a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that had previously been published about weight and swine flu and found that higher weight was not actually a risk factor at all. There was actually a confounding variable where higher weight people basically got worse medical care, and that's why their outcomes were worse. So I go into this in more detail in the op-ed that I'm working on, and I don't want to give the whole story away right here. But suffice it to say that we should learn from that, from that H1N1 situation, that swine flu situation, not to blame higher weight until we get the full story. And it's very likely that there's going to be some confounding variables here, too. And with the swine flu pandemic, people were also freaking out about higher weight being a risk factor, a supposed risk factor. And in fact, it wasn't. In fact, any excess risk disappeared when researchers controlled for the quality of care that people got. Now, just in the past day, as I'm recording this, there have been two new studies that just came out. One is from France reporting that there was a disproportionate number of people on the very highest end of the BMI spectrum at one particular hospital in France. So take that all with a grain of salt, right? But these people were more likely to be put on ventilators. And the other study is from New York, and it was actually just a letter to the editor of a scientific journal rather than a, a featured study, like a robust study. But that letter to the editor did report that people under the age of 65 who were in larger bodies seem to be at higher risk of going into acute care from the emergency room. So they go to the ER like everyone. And then, you know, some people are discharged to go home and some people are sent into the hospital into acute care. The larger bodied folks under 65 were more likely to be sent into acute care and also more likely to go to the ICU. Interestingly, body size didn't have any effect with people who were over 65. Now, the French study was very small, so definitely I do not put much stock in those findings. And neither of these studies controlled for known health risk factors like race, income, access to health care, et cetera, which we know affect people's outcomes and are associated with being in a larger body as well. And of course, no research really ever controls for weight stigma or weight cycling, but we have to remember that those can likely explain most, if not all, of the excess health risks that we see in people in larger bodies. So in terms of your question, you know, you said, how can I convince people that weight has nothing to do with health? I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. It's really not that weight has nothing to do with health. It's that higher weight doesn't cause poor health. But higher weight people do experience health disparities in this culture because of discrimination and the stress that that creates, because of lower quality health care, because of discrimination from doctors and healthcare professionals and discrimination in the world in general, because of increased mental health problems and disordered eating behaviors, um, because of higher levels of weight cycling as well, which is an independent risk factor for all kinds of things that get blamed on weight itself but can actually be explained by weight cycling, like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mortality, some forms of cancer, et cetera. So in other words, it's those things, it's those factors like weight stigma, weight cycling, socioeconomic status, et cetera, not weight itself that are likely causing the worst health outcomes we see among larger bodied people. So we always, always, always have to take that into account when thinking about any research on weight and health. And by the way, when you say, you know, the CDC is saying that, that weight is a problem, the CDC kind of always says that weight is a problem. The CDC loves to blame larger body size for everything under the sun. And yet it doesn't take into account these confounding variables that I was just talking about. Race, socioeconomic status, weight stigma, weight cycling, and the disparities that those things create. 
So the CDC really is, I would say, a pretty fat phobic institution, and its pronouncements on weight should really be taken with a big grain of salt because everything it does kind of has some fat phobia woven in, more or less. And so it's no surprise that its guidance on weight for COVID-19 is also kind of fat phobic. Another thing I want to make sure to mention here is that in those two studies I was just talking about, there was no increased risk of death for larger bodied folks. And in fact, some other data suggests that higher weight could actually be protective in that regard. So I go into that a little bit more in the op-ed that I'm writing, but as I've shared on social media already, the Louisiana Health Department recently reported that 25% of the people who've died of COVID-19 in that state were in the so-called obese BMI category, but 35% of the state's overall population falls into that category, according to the CDC. So, you know, there's 10% fewer folks dying of COVID-19 in that BMI category than actually exist in that BMI category. So if anything, those numbers may indicate that being in a larger body could actually lower people's risk of death. And in the op-ed, I explained some of the mechanisms for why that could be. Obviously, it's early still, right? And there's more studies coming out every day. I've like been deluged by them in the week that I've been working on this piece. And there's more we may learn about risk factors once more science starts getting published. And so, you know, there's probably going to be other research coming out that says, oh, look, quote unquote, obesity is a risk factor. Wah, worry about it. But that's in part because of our fat phobic medical system and our fat phobic scientists in this country, right? People in the US and in the Western world are extremely likely to be fat phobic. And the real science that we have out of China already, I think, is really interesting because from what that shows, high BMI on its own just isn't a risk factor. There really is very little evidence from China. Only one study, in fact, mentioned it as a potential risk factor. I'll come back to that in a second. But basically all the evidence out of China doesn't see weight as a risk factor. Things like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, other pre-existing conditions, they do find evidence that those things are risk factors. But in China, high BMI just didn't seem to be a risk factor. In terms of the percentage of people who actually are larger bodied, China has about a third of its population in larger bodies where the U.S. has about two thirds. So, you know, that's maybe a possibility, except that there were so many studies out of China with so many people that you would think if it was a problem at all and if a third of China's population was in larger bodies that we would see at least some evidence of larger, you know, of, of higher weight, higher BMI being a risk factor in Chinese studies. And that just really hasn't happened, except for one Chinese study so far, which found that high BMI may be a risk factor when combined with heart disease. So among people who had COVID-19 and pre-existing heart disease, a higher BMI predicted more serious outcomes. But that doesn't mean that high BMI on its own is a risk factor, right? Because any link between COVID and cardiovascular disease and BMI doesn't mean that higher weight causes poor outcomes in COVID-19 among CVD patients. It just may mean that higher weight people are sicker to begin with because of weight stigma and weight cycling, both of which we know are independent heart disease risk factors. And so you have a situation where, you know, if you have larger bodied people who have heart disease and they've experienced a lot of weight stigma and weight cycling, maybe that's what contributed to or caused the heart disease to develop in the first place and made them sicker with heart disease in the first place than the people in, lar in smaller bodies going into the hospital with COVID-19. And so the people in larger bodies had poor health outcomes because their heart disease was more progressed, because they had, you know, these greater risk factors of weight stigma and weight cycling at play. So that is, you know, research, again, to take with a grain of salt and put into this context of what are the underlying risk factors? What are the other things that could explain this difference besides just blaming body size? Because we know from decades and decades of research that blaming body size doesn't actually result in better health outcomes, right? Blaming body size leads to dieting and disordered eating like you've experienced, Mata, and, you know, body shame and discrimination against people in larger bodies and all kinds of things that actually worsen people's health outcomes. And dieting doesn't work, right? Trying to lose weight 
doesn't actually work for the vast, vast majority of people for more than a few years. And so almost everybody is destined, you know, up to 98% of people are destined to weight cycle when they try to lose weight. And so we don't have any evidence to show that demonizing or blaming higher weights for health outcomes is beneficial at all. In fact, it's totally counterproductive. And so how can we look at this data in a different way? How can we look at this data to see what are the health disparities being brought to light? What are the reasons other than just blaming body size that this could be happening? So the bottom line is really that there's no hard and fast evidence to suggest that high weight causes higher risk for COVID-19 in and of itself. It may be a risk factor when combined with other things, but it's not a cause. And there's certainly no evidence to even hint that losing weight is a form of prevention or cure. There's no scientific data at all to suggest that that is helpful in any way in COVID-19. And in fact, we know that restriction and malnutrition are risk factors for worse outcomes in a lot of other illnesses. So it's likely that restricting and depriving yourself here would actually have negative results and would be harmful to your well-being. So please don't diet. Please don't go back to your eating disorder. And you have full permission to continue strong in your recovery, knowing that you're doing the best you possibly can to take care of yourself by not restricting. And just try not to buy these fat phobic messages. I know it can be so hard in this culture, but really don't worry if you see some studies or you see a bunch of people spouting off that higher weight is a risk factor and that it therefore proves that there's something wrong with being at a higher weight and blah, 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 right? Because that is just diet culture doing its diet culture thing. And that is exactly what we're always fighting against here, right? We're fighting to dismantle diet culture. And I predict that even if there are some studies along the way that suggest weight is a risk factor, when all is said and done, when all the research is out there and the meta-analyses are done, you know, five years from now or whatever it is, we will see that things like race and socioeconomic status and quality of care, which is one form of weight stigma, those kinds of things will explain the excess risk we're seeing in people in larger bodies for more serious cases of COVID-19. It's not going to be down to body size itself. We're not going to be able to blame body size itself. And of course, there are forms of weight stigma and weight cycling that will never be controlled for in the research, but that we very much know to be risk factors in and of themselves. So right now, for you, Meta, who asked the question, and for everyone listening, the best thing you can do, even at the very highest end of the weight spectrum, is just to keep taking care of yourself in the way that we all need to be doing right now. And that means keep staying home as much as is humanly possible, keep washing your hands frequently and staying at least six feet away from anyone outside your household, wearing a cloth mask if you have to go out in public, disinfecting all frequently touched surfaces every day like your computer, your phone, your doorknobs, your cabinet handles, etc., And try not to fall prey to weight stigma. I know that is so much easier said and done right now, but please take care of yourself. We know weight stigma is harmful and we need you to fight this fight and help stop diet culture. So thanks again for that great question. And if you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then if you want to ask me any question you want and have me answer it much more quickly and consistently and multiple questions a month, you can join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. The course has a monthly Q&A podcast just for course participants where you get to ask your own questions every month and have me answer them and listen to hundreds of answers I've given to other participants already so that you can work through all the nuances of intuitive eating and really put it into practice in your own life. The course also has 13 modules of audio and written content teaching you the principles of intuitive eating, plus a private community forum just for course participants, where you can have daily guidance from me and my team, as well as hundreds of other great people who are on this anti-diet path with you. One of them is a participant named Mindy, who had this to say recently about the course. This program was pivotal in helping me break free from the food, diet, and exercise obsession, the self-shaming, and the constant underlying feeling that I'm permanently broken, out of control, etc. that comes from diet culture. 
The feeling of freedom from diet culture is invaluable. My mind is freed up and I'm enjoying things more than I used to because I'm not thinking about food or feeling shame. I am getting my life back. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim your life, you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by Thread Up. Being stuck at home is a great opportunity to take inventory of your closet, get rid of the things that don't work, and trade them in for cute, comfortable pieces that fit your body and your style. Thread Up is the world's largest online thrift store with up to 90% off of estimated retail. And today you can get an extra 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash foodpsych. I got the cutest leopard print shift dress from ThreadUp right before all this social distancing started, and I can't wait to finally go somewhere again so that I can wear it. But meanwhile, I think I'm probably going to hit them up again for some sweatpants because being comfy and cozy is honestly one of the things that helps me not panic at this anxious time. Get the styles you love at a fraction of the price. You'll look and feel good with ThreadUp. And for Food Psych listeners, here's an exclusive offer just for you. Get an extra 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash foodpsych. That's T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H for 30% off your first order. Threadup.com slash foodpsych for an extra 30% off today. Terms apply. And now, without any further ado, let's go to my conversation with Abigail Sagi. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. I did not struggle with weight as a kid. My natural body type was on the thinner side. And so this wasn't really an issue for me as a kid. Even so, it's hard to be a teenager in especially a, a, a young woman or girl in American society without being negatively affected by diet culture. And my mom was always dieting, always on Weight Watchers. And so I definitely picked up the cultural message that it's better to be thin and that one can never be too thin. So I did, even though I really didn't need to, I did begin dieting in high school. I remember for the for my prom, uh, my goal was to be as thin and as tan as possible. I spent a lot of time uh, sunbathing and running and restraining my my food intake. And then I also I when I went to college, I remember becoming concerned because everyone was saying, "Oh, the freshman <laughs> is unavoidable." And ironically, my fears and my efforts to avoid putting on that weight. I think actually led to some weight gain in that I didn't eat the, I I might not eat as much at mealtime and then compensate afterwards because I was hungry. And it also just created, it was a source of of unhappiness that that didn't, was completely unnecessary. I did get, not develop a full-blown eating disorder, but I came pretty close during a semester abroad in France and I was really not eating enough. Uh, It was not healthy and I became too thin for my own self. Then, you know, luckily I had a really great girlfriend with whom I traveled over Europe that summer and she kind of talked me out of it. She had had a history with bulimia that she had overcome and she was just not going to get pulled into my own craziness at that time. So that was lucky. And after that, you know, I had a, I I kind of developed a, a more healthy relationship with food, but, but still I, I'm a sociologist and I think we, you know, we are affected by the social world around us. It's, we cannot, you know, we don't live in a bubble and we live in a world that is very, really emphasizes thinness. And there's a lot of thin privilege and fat based stigma. And so, of course, that has also affected me over over my lifetime as, as a woman growing up and, and living in, in the society. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it can't it can't not affect us, right? That absolutely, especially those of us. I mean, and, and it sort of disproportionately, of course, affects people in larger bodies at the higher end of the weight spectrum, and disproportionately affects people with other marginalized identities as well. But really, no one is immune from it. No one can escape it. Right. Absolutely. And I've you know, for most of my life, I have received I've received a lot of thin privilege, and this is something that I'm very 
aware of. And what I've tried to do in my work is to use that thin privilege to do research that reveals the privilege and the and the other side of the privilege, which is the, the discrimination and the bias uh, that exists, and try to produce work that leads people to think more critically about it. And yes, we all we are all of us are affected by these kinds of inequalities in different ways and to, for to, to different extents. Yeah, and I'm struck by something you said in your in your second book What's Wrong with Fat is that thinness is an unmarked category similar to how whiteness is an unmarked category for race and maleness is an unmarked category for gender where people are seen as not having skin in the game, not having a stake in, you know, the argument when they are in one of these unmarked categories and so therefore given sort of more authority to speak about these issues whereas someone in a larger body who's talking about fatness might be seen as, you know, and and often is seen as by trolls and fat phobes seen as trying to justify their fatness or as not a credible interlocutor because they have this stake in the argument, whereas, you know, a thin person couldn't possibly. And I really appreciated your pointing out the fact that, you know, thin people definitely have skin in the game with this too. It's in a different way. And like, you know, we have a different experience in the world, but of course we're not immune to this fat phobia that surrounds us. Right. Just as we all have gender and we all have race, we all have bodies and body size and, you know, privilege is is just a different type of, of stake or a different perspective on an issue. But it it's not having privilege doesn't mean that you're unbiased, right? It's, it's a different kind of bias. One of the things that I think is powerful about sociology and other uh, social sciences and, and critical theory is the way that it can make us aware of these things that that we may not be aware of, especially if we are in the you know, in the position of having an un, being having that unmarked status for whatever it is. I mean, people who have are marked are aware. You know, women see gender. People of color see race. Fat people see weight based stigma. Right? It's the the people who are in these unmarked category who don't see it. The white people who don't see race don't think it matters, or the men who, uh, you know, the cisgender straight men who don't see gender as as structuring the world and and conferring resources and likewise the the thinner people who who don't perceive the enormous weight-based discrimination and stigma that exists yeah absolutely I, i think it's so important to learn about that privilege and start to dismantle it and start to look at things through the eyes of people who don't have the privileges that you have Yes, absolutely. And to and to try to understand how these structures of inequality and privilege work as social structures outside of individuals and how they're produced and reproduced and, and how they can also be challenged. And so in this new book that I've just published with Oxford University Press, Come Out, Come Out, Whoever You Are, I look at the ways different people, including members of the fat acceptance movement, come out as having as being members of these marked categories and in so doing resist stigma make people question their prejudices and bring about social change that's so important i love it i want to talk all about that book and also your second book what's wrong with facts i think that's one that our audience would really resonate with as well but i want to jump back a little bit and talk first about like how you got into this work how did you was it partly your own experience with that sort of disordered eating period in your life that led you into wanting to do this work or where did that play in it's a really interesting question i do think that the unconscious plays a really important role in making certain research topics compelling or even irresistible and others less interesting of course, the unconscious is unconscious, so we never have full access to it. And so we can talk and I can hypothesize about what, why I chose this, the, the topics I did. But I, I think it's good to keep in mind that I don't really know myself. I did have a, even before any of any issues around body size or eating, I did have a very formative experience with bullying when I was in seventh grade. And it lasted for a year. It was quite traumatic. It was also through that experience, I made 
three of my closest friends with whom I'm still close today. So it was a, a an opportunity for growth. And before that happened, I mean, the reason the bully turned against me was because I didn't tolerate bullies. And I challenged this very bully for picking on other kids. And I think through that experience, it made me even more intolerant of of bullies. And I, it's just always been a thing that I feel really strongly about. And I think also from that experience, I became really fascinated by how, you know, I, I was I was in seventh grade. I was ostracized by the entire grade. No one was speaking. To me. It was it was very extreme and traumatic. And I started figuring out, you know, doing my I wasn't studying. I hadn't taken a single sociology class at that point. But, you know, I had to learn strategies on my own of how to deal with this and how to overcome this. And I think that is maybe the reason why later I became really interested in social movements. So the very first social movement that I studied when I was an undergraduate and then was also directly related to my PhD dissertation and my first book, which was on sexual harassment, was the, was the women's movement. So I became very interested in feminist organization. But the questions I was interested in are the same questions that have driven my entire career, which is, you know, how does a marginalized group, an oppressed group, gain power and control? How do they how do they organize? How do they respond both individually and collectively to improve their lot? And so the PhD dissertation, uh, which became a 2003 book, What is Sexual Harassment from Capitol Hill to the Sorbonne, was about how and why sexual harassment has been defined differently in the U.S. and France. And there, too, you know, it's a story of how do women who are being terrorized, oppressed at work. There's no word for it because this term sexual harassment didn't even exist until 1976. How do they come up with a language and then use law and other means to fight back and uh, against something like sexual harassment? And then when I, so I finished that work, I got my PhD in the year 2000. And then I got this wonderful postdoc through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It was a postdoc in health policy research. And I had to do something that was related to health policy. I hadn't done any health policy work up until then. So I originally thought I was going to work on patient rights. And I had proposed to do something on that. And I got I had some colleagues and we started talking about it in a meeting, but I just it just didn't excite me. I couldn't really get into it. At the same time, a couple of my colleagues at Yale University, which is where I was housed through this postdoc, were talking about the obesity epidemic. And they, they were political scientists, and they were asking, you know, why isn't this on the public agenda? It's obesity is going to soon overtake smoking as the leading cause of preventable death. You know, so they were taking for granted this rhetoric that we're starting to see a lot of in, in 2000, 2001. And so I said, oh, this is really interesting. Yeah, what, what's going on with debates over weight? And they were asking, why isn't it political? And so I'm like, oh, yeah, what are the politics of body size? And I discovered the fat acceptance movement. And I thought, wow, that is really interesting. You know, talk about an uphill battle. Talk about a group that's really taking on a lot of unexamined prejudice. You know, how are they doing that? And I also read Glenn Gaser's book, Big Fat Lies, and started becoming much more skeptical of all of this public health rhetoric about obesity that we were reading. And it appealed to me, the whole thing. I was just very interested in the fat acceptance movement. I went to my first NAFA meeting that summer, the summer of 2000 in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and um, or maybe it was 2001, one of those years. And I read Gazer's Big Fat Lies, and he also came and gave a talk at NAFA. That may have been how I originally found him, or maybe not. But I just became interested in all of this and spent about a decade researching the scientific debates over body weight, reading fat acceptance activists from as early as the 70s with the fat underground and Shadow on the Tightrope and Marilyn Wan's wonderful book, Fat So, speaking to Marilyn Wan and other really inspiring people in the fat acceptance movement. And 
ultimately in 2013, I published the book that you mentioned earlier, What's Wrong with Fat? And there's also a chapter in this new book, Come Out, Come Out, Whoever You Are, that looks at coming out as fat. I think that's so interesting, the idea of coming out as fat, too. And you you say in the new book that it's like a glass closet, right? That people who are fat, it's like sort of obvious to everyone around them. But then there's also this way in which there has to be an act of coming out and sort of embracing that identity. Yes, absolutely. So the first time that I heard this term coming out as fat was at this conference that I mentioned, the the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance Annual Conference. So there used to be one every year. And I was asking people about their experience with the fat acceptance movement. How did they get involved? And again and again, people said to me, well, I came out as fat on this day in this way. Or, you know, let me tell you how I came out as fat. Or they would say, well, I was a closeted fat person until I came out. And I was like, gosh, wow, I had never, I'd never heard this before. I was just discovering the fat acceptance movement, so I didn't really know much about it. But I thought, gosh, that's really interesting because, you know, normally we think of coming out as revealing something that otherwise people wouldn't know. And and certainly people, you know, the, their body size wasn't something that people wouldn't know if they were seeing them in person, right? It's hyper visible. But then I did realize over time and exploring this more that they are revealing something hidden. They're revealing their attitude, right? That they're not, they're not ashamed about it. They're not, they refuse to apologize. They refuse to be shamed and silenced because of their weight. And there is huge power in that. And, you know, in that sense too, the refusal of shame and the refusal of silence, it's very similar to coming out as LGBTQ or, you know, coming out in other contexts. And, and even, you know, even many people, many of your listeners know that often when people come out as gay or lesbian, people know, right? It's often a kind of well-known secret, right? And not, not such a secret. And so even in those contexts, sometimes what coming out means is just refusing, no longer pretending like this isn't a thing or it's not important, owning it. Right, really. In French, they say to s'assume, to do, to, to really take responsibility or own this part of your identity. So, yeah, and it and it is really powerful because when you're ashamed of your very being, and someone can simply say, you know, you're fat, and you'll kind of slink away. That's a really important form of disempowerment. And when you own it and you refuse to apologize for it, then you're taking back that power. Well, and it's, it's, you know, the idea of framing too, right? It's like how we, how we're framing it to ourselves, how we're framing it to the world, you know, and, and your, your second book, uh, What's Wrong with Fat really gets into this idea of framing fatness and how the different ways that we frame it have effects on people's well-being and have effects on, you know, people's conceptions of fatness and their likelihood of discriminating against other people for being fat. And one thing that I, I took from that book that I use constantly in my work is the idea that, and from, from your other studies as well beyond that book, is that showing people reports of the so-called obesity epidemic and how it's bad for health and how people have a personal responsibility to, you know, eat less and move more to avoid being fat, that that alone is enough to create weight stigma in the people who read those reports. And to me, that's really important for this work that I do because I think a lot of people these days on the eradicating fat people side of the spectrum, right? The doctors and dietitians and therapists and people that, that think and believe that quote unquote obesity is an epidemic that needs to be stopped often say that they care about weight stigma, that they understand that weight stigma is a problem, that we don't want to ever stigmatize people for their body size, but we just want to help them be less fat. We just want to help them, quote unquote, improve their health by shrinking their bodies and don't understand the nuances and don't understand the subtle ways in which even telling someone that they need to shrink their body, even telling someone that it's their responsibility to do that in order to improve their health is stigmatizing them, is creating weight stigma in their mind. Yes, ab absolutely. And uh, with my colleague, David Frederick, 
at Chapman University, we've tried to, you know, we've done a series of experiments, including with other authors, and we've tried to see if we could manipulate that so that you were reading something that was saying both that we, we shouldn't stigmatize, but also that this was a public health crisis. And it's very difficult to do. You know, the public health crisis frame, this idea that it's unhealthy to be heavy and the rising numbers of people with a BMI over is a crisis, that is extremely stigmatizing. And when people are exposed to that kind of reporting, they are more likely to endorse weight-based discrimination. So, yeah, so this is, and besides the fact that it's completely unnecessary because we can, first, we don't know how to make fat people thin. That's something that nobody knows how to do. So there's not really a point in trying to do it if all of the means we have fail. And in fact, most of them end up making most people heavier long term. But the other thing is we do know how to improve people's health, right, without having to make them thin. So if people become more active, it might not lead to weight loss. And if we're, and often it won't, right? So if we're focused on the weight loss as the goal and people make, you know, improve their diet, get more active and then still don't lose weight, if we're focusing on weight, they're more likely to be like, well, forget it. I'm doing all this for nothing. If we could just focus on the behaviors themselves, as well as other things that are so important for health, like friendships and laughing and, and things like that, smoking cessation is a big one. If we could just focus on those behaviors and not so much on the body size, we would really do people much, much more good. Agreed. And also focusing on weight and stigmatizing people for their weight has the exact opposite effect. There's so much research now that shows like stigmatizing people for their weight makes them actually eat more of the foods that were forbidden and that people are told not to eat when they're trying to lose weight, makes them more likely to avoid physical activity. And stigma is not helping them in that sense. And the disordered eating, I think, that gets created by this fat phobic culture and this culture that also shames people for eating certain foods and praises them for eating others in many cases, in most cases, I would say, probably because of the implied weight loss that's supposed to follow. That creates so much disordered eating that makes people unable to do the things that they know can take care of their well-being too. You know, it's like you can't really, and I mean, I say to a lot of my clients who are coming to me trying to heal from diet culture and then this early stage of rejecting it where they just can't even look at a vegetable because it's like they've been down that road and basically use vegetables as bludgeons to beat themselves with. And it's like, yeah, you probably need a break from that. And to have that reaction to something that actually could be beneficial speaks to how toxic this culture really is. Right. Absolutely. And the direct experience of of stigma, you know, being stigmatized, being rejected, the stress that is associated with all of that directly affects people's health negatively. You know, it leads to spikes in cortisol and heart rate and blood pressure, et cetera. So it's, we know this, you know, discrimination of any kind is just unhealthy. It's not good for our health. And so we certainly, if we care about people's health, the last thing we want to be doing is worsening weight-based discrimination of stigma. Oh, seriously. So important to highlight that. And so important for medical professionals and health professionals of all kinds to understand that. Because I think in this culture, we really deliver so many of the supposedly health-promoting messages with a big heaping side order of weight stigma. And that just cancels out any benefits that, that the messages could potentially have. Right. Absolutely. I mean, my research really supports that. Yeah. I mean, I was so struck by the fact that even when people, even when those reports have anti-stigma messaging in them, that's not enough. That doesn't even scratch the surface. That's right. It's not enough. And you're, and, you know, and the people who are reading these are coming from a social context, of course, where they're exposed to so many other news reports. And most of those are stigmatizing of, of bigger bodies, right? And so you need to have a much stronger message to start to counteract that. And so it's really not until we, it's only the articles that are really have a strong health at every size message that people can be healthy at every size, that weight-based discrimination is a, is a real problem, is a social 
ill, et cetera, that we, we are able to budge people's opinions at all on things like weight-based discrimination and stigma. I think that's so important for anyone who's a journalist to hear as well. My first career was in journalism and still kind of kept that up alongside my going back to school to become a dietitian. And I have so many journalist colleagues who feel like, well, we have to report on the risks of quote unquote obesity and we can't sort of let go of that piece. We have to tell both sides of the story. You know, it's like a, kind of an extension of the both sidesism that we see in political reporting. I think it happens like across the board, even with stories about racism and things like that as well. But it's this idea of we can't keep people in the dark about the fact that higher body weight supposedly confers these excess risks instead of seeing the bigger picture that, yes, there's an association between higher body weight and risk, health risks, but it's not explained by the fact that body weight causes those risks, that stigma is a really important mediator there. And so is weight cycling and so is poverty and race and lots of other things too. Right, absolutely. We simply do not know the ca the causation. So, I mean, the case where you see the strongest association between higher weight and bad health is with type two diabetes. In in some cases, there's the association is not even there, right? So, it's not even always true that there's an association. If you look at all causes of death, mortality, the people on the so-called overweight, the BMI between are the least likely to die. If you look at people who already have heart disease, those who are overweight and obese are less likely to die than people in the normal weight category. So sometimes the associations are not even there. And, you know, in those cases, people are like, but how can that be? Well, we don't know. We don't know the, the cause. But the same is true when there is an, you know, an, an, an association between higher weight and negative health, health outcomes. We don't understand the causal mechanisms. It's possible, you know, it is a possibility that gaining weight increases one's risk of type 2 diabetes. But it's also possible that insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes causes weight gain. There's a good argument for that. And it's also very possible and probable that there are third factors that cause both. And you've mentioned a few of these, you know, stress poverty, these sorts of things are causing both higher weight and increased risk of diabetes and, and other things. The fact is we just don't we just don't know and association does not equal causation. Yes. I feel like that has to be said like a million times. <laughs> People really need to hear that. I'm also interested in talking a little bit about this idea of a sociocultural frame that you talk about in in the book that you know, it's, I think, really started to be, in certain circles anyway, the the framing of higher body weight is now, you know, it's like, it's not the person's fault, it's the food environment's fault, right? And this, it's the sociocultural environment that a person is in that's causing them to be fat. And so let's fix the food environment in order to change people's weight. And you make such a great point in the book that that frame gets applied disproportionately to certain groups that are already stigmatized and that it's also the supposed solutions that come from that frame are anything but sociocultural. They're actually very individualistic. Yeah. And I think they also continue to stigmatize bigger bodies. If you're saying that, the, you know, what is the problem that you're addressing? So if you're saying, I mean, there's so many, so sometimes it's absolutely ridiculous, right? Where they're like, oh, high crime is a problem because people aren't going outside and exercising and they're getting fat. Well, high crime is a problem because you might get shot and because you're scared. And, you know, so in some cases, like, we don't need to make it about body weight. Like, if people don't have access to good food because they live in a food desert, that's a problem. Even if it doesn't make them heavy, some people might be thin, but they're still, they don't have access to nutrition, right? So. That's a problem. And so this idea that we can't kind of create urgency around the, the actual problem of poverty, of violent neighborhoods, unsafe streets, or lack of access to green spaces, lack of access to food deserts, the fact that we need to use bigger bodies as a kind of scary boogie person, that should cause us a lot of self-reflection as a society because we should be able to address these really important problems directly because they are important in their in their own right 
without having to get into body size at all. Why do you think that is that we use body size as this sort of bugbear to try to get people to pay attention to those issues? Why can't we just pay attention to them and think of them as important in their own right? Yeah, I mean, uh, here I'm going to sound pretty cynical, but I think a lot of people have a lot of fear around bigger bodies. They fear gaining weight themselves. It's a scary thing for them. And understandably, in a society where there is so much weight-based discrimination, that is a scary thing. They're fearful of other bodies that seem to be out of control, and that's a scary thing. So I think it grabs people's attention. And I think, you know, we, we have a lack. The U.S. really struggles with, has struggled with a lack of empathy for poor people. And you can't understand that without understanding the very deeply ingrained racism in this country and the way the, the way a lot of white people associate poverty and social problems with, with black people and the way the kind of feeling of, of we're all in this boat together and we're all, we're the, 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 the empathy and the, the ability to see yourself on the other, the way boundaries have been drawn around race in this country that have, that are very longstanding and have to do with our history of racism and, the color line and the and and all of that it's it's very deep and it affects every every aspect of american society yeah i mean as you were talking about those issues too that that's kind of what struck me is like yeah i feel like we don't pay attention to food deserts affecting black and brown people because as a society we're racist. It's it's white supremacy that doesn't allow for that to become a grabby issue just unto itself Right. And of course, there's even more white people who are poor and who rely on social assistance than black people just because there's more white people in the population. But the way these programs, these social programs have been, and not just coincidentally, but there's been actually movements to do this intentionally to erode social support for them, the way they've been associated with people of color has gone for, far to erode social support. So they get misperceived as, oh, it's, you know, only, it's only black people who are on welfare, for instance, you know, the image of the welfare mom being a heavy black woman. Of course, they're not the majority of, of welfare recipients, but that image, that understanding has really eroded support for these social pro- programs in general. And it's one of the reasons why we have such a weak safety net in the United States compared to other more homogenous societies like in Scandinavia. That's really fascinating. I think that's so true that it's been like this systematic chipping away at support for those programs and those programs like welfare and SNAP benefits, food stamps, as they used to be known, like that is something that could help potentially address some of the disparities in access to food that now just doesn't have funding behind it. Yeah, absolutely. And discussion of the obesity epidemic and the way this issue gets framed feeds, so to speak, (laughs) right into these issues, right? So you hear politicians saying, well, you know, these people, look at them. They don't need food stamps. Just look at them. Ha, ha, ha. You know, clearly they're not, you know, they haven't missed a meal, which of course completely, you know, shows complete misunderstanding as to how food insecurity works and the way it's like a enforced weight loss diet, right? Where you come to the end of the month and you don't have enough. And so you don't eat, you're like in starvation mode at the end of the month. And then the new month comes along and you compensate and, and eat all of this food because you're starving. And just this leads to weight gain. It's one of the mechanisms of weight gain and, and one of the ways in which food insecurity is linked with you know, higher body mass. And that higher body mass, again, is the thing that's getting pathologized and not the food insecurity. It's not It's not about addressing the thing that is actually a fundamental human rights violation. Like, the, you know, everybody deserves equal access to food and to have enough food and to feel secure that they are going to be fed and that they know where the next meal comes from. And that alone is not enough to move people to act. 
that's like we have to demonize the body size that's a result of it and then institute policies that are actually totally counterproductive to food security. Yeah, and, and policies that are punitive. Right, absolutely. Yeah, this idea of limiting what people can buy with their food assistance dollars and policing their ability to feed themselves in a way that feels pleasurable, you know, and that gives them access to what they really need. Because, of course, when you're food insecure, you want to actually get the most bang for your buck nutritionally. You know, you want to get the most calories for the least amount of money possible. Right. And your and your body metabolizes food very differently if you if you've been starving, you know, so our bodies learn to be much more economical with calories if the bodies have been exposed to famine, right? And so food insecurity is a kind of famine. And during that time, the body, the metabolism slows down, it, it prepares for this next famine, and it stocks up, you know, this is how we've evolved to stock up in fat is, is a re- energy reserve for the next famine. So it's taking, again, a structural problem that certain people in this wealthy nation of ours don't have enough to eat or starving at least part of the month and reframing it in terms of personal responsibility and blame. Oh, those people, they, you know, just don't know how to manage their money. They, you know, don't know how to make good choices. They are indulging, et cetera. And yeah, it's a way of shirking collective responsibility for our communities and for blaming blaming the victims. And that happens even with a sociocultural frame too, right? The people who are trying to do good and maybe bring food into underserved communities, it ends up being under this guise of it's, you know, you need to learn how to make better choices with food and here are the foods that you should be eating and we're going to sort of constrain your choices and you have to learn how to feed yourself appropriately or whatever, instead of dealing with the structural issues and working to end poverty and systemic racism and food insecurity, you know, that drive this issue in the first place. It's like taking it down to the individual level, even among people who would, I think, consider themselves progressive. Like I write in my book about Michael Pollan and the food activist movement of the early 2000s and how that really had such unintended consequences of demonizing the kinds of foods that people really need access to when they're poor and making it about we have to teach low-income people how to choose the quote-unquote right foods and eat in the way that white elites do rather than addressing what people actually need. Right. Absolutely. I mean, we do this all the time and with other issues as well. I have a, a colleague who, her name is Paige Sweet, who's done this really great work on victims of domestic violence and showing how in that case, too, the solutions end up being very individualized. Or there's another colleague who's been looking at prostitution and how there we try to solve that in, that problem by changing these sex workers' attitudes where really the problem is what's other ways to make money, right? And they don't address these these structural issues of needing to make money, right? So we do fall back in this country again and again at on personal responsibility and, you know, and there's some role for that. I think individual people, you know, to take some personal responsibility, but it you can't solve structural problems by relying on personal responsibility. You need to go to the heart of the structural problems. And something like poverty, that's a huge structural problem. And it has all sorts of negative implications for health. And it also leads to, it leads to, to bigger body size, but it's, it's most likely directly causing a lot of the health problems that we see. And yeah, it's really hard to improve people's health if there's an unwillingness to address these huge structural problems of of poverty, social inequality, et cetera, which are just getting worse. You know, you're, we're living through an age of growing inequality where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and it's not healthy for anybody. And when we see the the research on social determinants of health, I feel like that really bears it out too. Like from, you know, the research there, it seems to be that in terms of population level modifiable health determinants, only 
10% has anything to do with food or exercise and another 20% has anything to do with behaviors, any sort of health behaviors. So like only 30%, in some cases, some some estimates, even 25% of the pie is anything within our individual control that, would, you know, the individual responsibility would address. And the rest of it is structural. The rest of it is these social determinants of health, like race and socioeconomic status and experiences of discrimination and all that stuff that, yeah, like you said, really seems to directly affect people's health. It's not, it's not about, it's, you know, your body size or whatever. It's like, no, the, the stress of that discrimination and of living in a, an oppressed state is harmful to health. Absolutely. And of course, family history and genetics is a huge determinant in health as well. And people know this, and yet they still focus on the individual risk factors because they feel like that's what we can control. And whereas that might make sense for an individual person, like I might say, okay, well, I can't control my genes. I can't, you know, there's a lot that I can't control, but I I can make good choices. That's fine. Like for individual people to do, it's not good policy. (laughs) You know, like, it, when we're making policy, we should be able to think about organizing a society in a way that is beneficial to everyone's health. But that, you know, that hasn't been, that hasn't been the priority. And there's been a lot of greed and corporate interest uh, that has shaped a lot of things, including this issue. Yeah. And I mean, I think that that greed and corporate interest is so ha, has such an interest in neoliberal policy that says, oh, it's all on the individual. Let's put it on them to take care of their health and, you know, privatize everything and make people not address the structural issues and make people have to like claw their way out of oppression on their own and pull themselves up by their bootstraps and all this stuff. And it it definitely serves to benefit the corporations and the lobbyists and people who are in the pockets of the lobbyists, politicians, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's not, it's not benefiting average people. And it's so, it feels like that's so entrenched now in our system, in our government, that it's going to be really hard to untangle from it. Right. Absolutely. I mean, especially if we have another Republican president in the next election and and another Republican Senate, it's going because their goals are to shrink the government, to, to give tax, huge tax giveaways to big corporations and really to shrink the social safety net as opposed to expand it. So it go, it's an absolutely direct opposition to the kinds of changes that would really have a, a meaningful, positively affect people's health, not to mention, you know, access to health care and not going broke, right? Not having to choose between financial solvency and health care, which is really the choice for a lot of people today. And that's what the insurance companies who are paying off politicians really want too is for them to line their pockets and for people to just figure it out and some of them go bankrupt or die trying to get health care. Right. The insurance companies are not charities. They're not government bodies that are entrusted with the welfare of our population. They are money making corporations who, you know, respond to their shareholders and, and the goals are really to make money. So it's a real you know, it's a real risk to empower them with the health of our nation. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> it really is. I mean, I think it. I think yeah, we're in such a this moment that we're talking actually is sort of a a testament to that. The coronavirus situation absolutely has so many people panicking, and today the Senate just refused to pass legislation to extend benefits, you know, sick leave to people who are affected by coronavirus. And that's that's what you get. That's what you get when you elect officials who put corporate interests above the public interest. Right. I mean, it's a scandal. Uh, it's a scandal. And this is going to get worse. The coronavirus is going to get worse before it gets better. And I think one of the things, one of the lessons it has is this, this idea that you can insulate yourself with your wealth it's it's a fallacy. We're breathing the same air. We're touching the same surfaces. And these viruses know no boundaries. And so if not everybody has access to health care, that is putting everyone at risk. And we've known this for some time. And we're getting a reminder right now. But it's unclear even now that 
that our leaders are willing to respond appropriately. Yeah, I, it's I don't know what it's going to take, honestly, if the, if not this, you know, it's I've watched a show comedy that was on a couple of years ago. I think it's since canceled, but it's it was called The Last Man on Earth about, you know, it's a, a funny show, but it was about the end of the world. And there's only a few people left because a virus has, you know, taken out everyone. And it's like the last few days I've been thinking about that show a lot and thinking about the weird parallels when our elected officials are getting exposed to it and you know, all of these people, not that, not to fear monger or say that like everybody's going to die from this because it's not the case. And this, you know, in 80% of cases, it's still very mild, but it's the people who are the most vulnerable that are getting affected by this. And it's very possible that in a year, everyone will have, will know a couple of people who have died from this. That is, you know, that is within the realm of possible, maybe even probable. And it's that, you know, that's bad enough. It's, it's pretty scary. But it, it very well may take until people start knowing people for this to hit home. Yeah, it's a terrifying moment that we're living in. But I mean, I think we do have some agency. You know, you're right in terms of electing officials who are going to change things and, you know, starting to not that this is a personal responsibility, but we, you know, we can push to change the culture. And as you share in your books, too, that there is hope in, in terms of people being able to change structures or at least find a, a place of community and support and sort of relief and respite from an oppressive structure, even if they're not able to topple the whole thing completely. Yes, absolutely. That is a message. And I think there is a lot of power in that and a power in people coming together and organizing for social change. I mean, we have seen a lot of positive change and in our lifetimes, in my lifetime, but it doesn't, it isn't inevitable and it doesn't happen on its own. It only happens because people are working really hard to make it happen. And we all need to be active, you know, take an active role in bringing about the future that we'd like to see. Yeah. What are some ways you think people can do that? Well, I mean, I, I think at this particular time, getting involved in, in this election and voting, you know, I think that's really important because I think that they, the, we're going to have two candidates with drastically different perspectives and visions for our future. So that's really important. And I think also being supportive and kind to each other. I, I am distressed by the, the way in which social discourse is, has really become much more, there's just a lot of anger and hostility that I see not just online, but also offline. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of people are struggling with a lot of things and we could stand to be more kind to each other. I think that is always useful and not to be so judgmental and to try to be empathetic and understand where others are coming from and to realize that we're more the same than we are different. I mean, I think that is one of the things that I realized in writing this book, Come Out, Come Out, Whoever You Are, is that, you know, I deal with so many different instances of stigma. So we've been talking about weight-based discrimination, but the book also talks about people coming out as undocumented. Of course, it talks about coming out within the LGBTQ community. It talks about the Me Too movement and speaking up against sexual assault and harassment. And across these cases, people are coming out, and the sexual harassment case is a little bit different, but in the others, coming out as having some kind of difference, you know, often viewed as an unwanted difference to, to take Irving Goffman's de definition of stigma and saying, you know, I'm claiming this. So whether it's using the word fat and reclaiming this word that's been used as an insult or, you know, reclaiming queer as a term that you're going to own and it's not going to be used to silence you or to, to make you feel ashamed. Or before that, you know, the, we've learned, you know, these social movement strategies were initially developed by the civil rights and black power movement that reclaimed black. Black is beautiful. And there's a lot of power in doing that for oneself to refuse to be silenced and stigmatized. And then I think the other part that's really powerful about coming out is to educate other people and to say, you know, you have all of these negative stereotypes about different groups, but I'm a member of that group. You know, so coming out as gay has been really important in the late 70s. And there was a Briggs initiative in San Francisco to ban 
gay men and lesbian from public school teaching, from public school teaching. Harvey Milk urged people to come out, come out to your friends, come out to your neighbors, come come out to people who know and like you, come out for the youngsters who, who are scared. And the idea was that if you come out and tell people, this is who you are, and they know and they like you, and they see that you're part of this group, that's going to make them question these negative stereotypes. So it's going to make them question an initiative that was going to ban this, this whole group from, you know, a profession. And I think the same thing with coming out as fat. You say, listen, you know, all of this talk, all of this, this negative stuff you're saying about fat, well, that affects me. You know, I, I'm fat and, I'm, and this is not something that I'm going to diet my way out of. No, this is part of who I am. This is an integral part of me. And if you like me and support me, then you're, you're going to stop that kind of fat phobic talk and maybe question your attitude. So it can be re- that kind of individual thing can also be really important in educating people and, um, and challenging oppression and, and discrimination. I love that. And I think too, it's like, that's an invitation and it's not a personal responsibility. Like, of course, everybody's at their own place with these different things. Everybody's on their own path in terms of feeling able to come out to the people in your life and feeling safe to do that. And, you know, everybody has their own timeline with that stuff, but it's the more people who do it, the more it becomes safe for others to do it too. And so those who are ready and who are in a place to be able to do it can help pave the way for others and can help, yeah, make the world a safer place for everyone really. Right. Absolutely. I mean, the risks of coming out are really pronounced right now for undocumented immigrant youth, which is another group that I discuss in this book. And yet there's a real, you know, there's a real contradiction there because if people, you know, by coming out, you're putting yourself at risk, you're putting your family members at risk, that that is a risky proposition. But by not coming out and being silent, you're also at risk because you're not speaking back against these policies that are stigmatizing your community, that are limiting the opportunities of people in your community. So, you know, in order for a social movement to be successful and to change attitudes, people need to come forward. So talk of coming out as undocumented and unafraid has been a way of overcoming that fear and then getting more people to speak out. And it is, as you say, often in stages and maybe they first will talk to someone who they think is supportive and who can help them get resources and school, for instance. And then if that goes well, they'll, they'll, they'll be more bold and talk to a larger group and maybe ultimately even publicly at a rally. Um, of course, it has to, you know, people should have control over their own disclosure and, and when they do that and how they do it. But it can have really powerful implications for the whole collective. Yeah, I love that, too, that, you know, we want to make sure everybody has agency and control over when they reveal that, but that whoever it is, you know, it doesn't have to be you, listener, listening. It can be, you know, your next door neighbor or your friend or whatever, but whoever is is ready and is in a place to do that is strengthening the collective. Yes, and I think the more people do it and the more models we have for doing that, role models, the easier it is for others. So. Again, we we are all interconnected. None of us are an island, and we we affect each other for better, for worse. Hopefully, for better. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a positive note to end on too. In this scary time that we're in. Excellent. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Can you tell us where to find you online and find your books and learn more about your work? Sure. Yeah. So the book is on Amazon. Come out, come out, whoever you are. You can also read some of my other published pieces and get my articles. If you go to my website, which is just my name, www.abigailsagui, all one word, that's S-A-G-U-Y dot com. I love it. We'll put links to all that in the show notes too, so people can find you easily. Terrific. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Abigail Sagi for joining us on this episode, and thanks to you for listening. If you're looking for some practical tips to help you get started on the anti-diet path, grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. 
If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please help us reach more people who need to hear the anti-diet message by sharing this episode and subscribing to the pod on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. You can see all the places to subscribe at christyharrison.com slash subscribe. That's christyharrison.com slash subscribe. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, just go to christyharrison.com slash 236. That's christyharrison.com slash 236. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. This episode was brought to you by ThreadUp. ThreadUp is the largest online thrift store with up to 90% off your favorite brands and a huge variety of styles and sizes, including plus sizes. Get an exclusive offer of an extra 30% off your first order when you go to threadup.com slash foodpsych. That's T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H for 30% off your first order today. Terms apply. A big thanks, as always, to our editor and sound engineer, Mike Lalonde, our community and content associate, Vinci Chue, and our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasek, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Melissa Alam. Our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. And I'm your host and producer, Christy Harrison. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Thank you.